hopefully that was a few minutes, a uh, bit of a, an interesting conversation in there. Um, let's just quickly show you a couple, I mean, just uh, briefly go through, through some of the things that you had on in there. So, uh, breakout room one, you have a few things like end-to-end -end workflows, um, some more there, so, you know, um, things like typical, you know, market research ideas, you know, MVPs, design, build, test, okay? So, um, the, the interesting thing that we see many times out there, or common patterns that we tend to see in many organizations, um, First of all, is like we, we tend to focus a lot of our agile um, at team level. So you might end up, you will see a lot of team level agility going on. Um, and boards might start looking like, you know, might have some very simple boards looking to things like this. Um, um, just a, a very focus on, on, on development. Um, we might have something like an external waiting if things happen like that, but that's, that's, that's the most common things that we see in agile. Um, most of the time still. Um, what happens next? We may start realizing that, hey, you know, it, it's from develop doesn't get to done. Maybe there is things like you are waiting for things like integration. Um, we might be having some things like an acceptance process. So we're waiting for acceptance. Um, we might be having like a big, you know, release processes. And if you start looking at things like that, yeah, um, what you have here is, um, things, for example, integration might have a monthly cadence if you're, if you're not particularly um, efficient at doing these things. You might have like quarterly acceptance cycles. You might have like quarterly release cycles. Um, and if you're starting to look at these things, yeah, the, the, the only column where work tends to happen is that develop column, while a lot of the other ones is waiting, waiting, waiting. Um, if we go to the other side, um, to the left side of the of our original original board, and we start having a wider view of what, what what's happening upstream from the board, we might start looking at things like, well, that board will will have things like that's the back development backlog, but we might still have like a analyze a analysis phase, or analysis phase where there's refinement, um, and you might have a product backlog. Um, keep going, keep expanding this, and you may have like all the way back from ideas, triage, rough, uh, having some concepts. Um, maybe we have some sort of like approval, steering committee, detailed concept. Um, then we want another approval stage and eventually we get to this, to this backlog. Um, so where we started with many times we have like, we, we are really focused on, on Agile at the team level. When we start looking at the end to end, they become much, much longer. There are much, many, many more steps, many more activities happening there, okay? Um, and if you notice those things, a lot of them are waiting for this, waiting for that, waiting for, for, for something else. So what we're gonna try to do is to have a way of visualizing how this end-to-end -end process works. Um, we're going to do a, an, ex, an exercise. We are going to call this like the, the flow snake. So I'm going to show you what, what we mean by this. Um, we're going to do next, uh, we're, you're going to go into breakouts again, probably the same, same groups. Um, but what we're going to do is give you, um, in this case, the, the link that will go into the chat will be, I need to find my right link now. Um, is going to be to this page where you will have a link to um, uh, for your breakout room. So from 1 to 20, you select the right document for you. And what we're going to end up is you will open a document like this. Instead of saying master, it will say breakout room 1, 2, 3, 4, okay? And what we're going to show you here is in page 2, you have a process. And in this case, the process is a process that we have you know, came up with about diagnosing, potentially diagnosing a child with um, ADHD. Um, so at every step, something will be happening and you have to decide if what's happening there or how much of what's happening there is something actively happening towards the diagnosing, diagnostics, um, 
or if it's something about where if nothing is happening, it's just waste, uh, waiting time. Okay. So for example, in the first step, I'm going to show you the first steps. Um, in this first step, you have a situation where I probably need to hide my screen. Um, you're going to have a situation that says like the school teachers uh, are worried about the child, maybe uh, may have ADHD and they decide to do notify the parents. Okay. Well, that sounds like a, an activity. Some, someone is doing something that they're sending a notification. So, if you look at in there, I'm going to say, okay, there is one activity. Today is one day. This day, something has been active. So I'm going to make that cell in here green. Now it says like, okay, the step two says uh, it takes three days to send a letter um, for the admin team to send a letter to the parents, notifying the parents. So, okay, so there has been three days of delay. I'm going to make that red until we actually send the letter. I'm gonna make that green. Yeah, the next one, step three says, uh, the post, the, that letter takes two days to get to, to you, to the parents. So I'm gonna say that they are like two days of waiting while the letter is just traveling and so on and so on. So here there will be some things that will take, for example, here it would be two weeks. You may have to put 14 or 15 red, uh, red cells. So you have a hundred cells for these 17 steps. You might not use them all, but we would like you to start building this snake of how much activ activity is compared to how much waiting, delays, and so on. Um, and that's gonna be this exercise about building what we call this flow snake. We are gonna give you something like 10 minutes to do this exercise. Try to go as far as you can. Hopefully you can do all, all 17 steps. Uh, Matt is gonna energize you, send you to the, uh, send you to your, to your breakout rooms. Sending across now. Everyone is back. I hope you had a lot of time, a uh, good time doing that, good conversation, and you went as far as you could. I think some groups did finish. Um, we were just talking that this is, this looks like a really, um, what is it, um, Ian, you said optimal version of the NHS. If it was the proper <laughs> NHS, would be about 300 cells, not, not 100. Um, just to show you, an ex um, for example, how, I mean, this is not about right or wrong, this is about like visualizing that process about what is active, what is inactive and so on. In this case, for example, um, when we did it ourselves, um, we just used 86 cells and as you can see, there is a little bit of pieces of activity, but there is so much waiting, so much steps in between. Okay. So hopefully, I mean, if I, if I, if I show you a few other, a few of, of your screens, um, but you can see very similar patterns of what you were coming up with. Yeah. Fantastic. Are. So what we typically end up with is something that looks a little bit like this. So we have these uh, huge weights all the way along with like, you know, yearly approval, quarterly steering committee, monthly integration, quarterly releases, all these different things going on. And we've generally just focused on the development team. And we spent an awful lot of time getting our, uh, getting the people who are building like kind of doing doing the creation of, of the product and becoming making them agile and so what we can see is we've got most of the time the work is just absolutely hanging around doing nothing and then every so often we're working on it a little bit and what that tends to look like is uh, at an organizational level the efficiency of of the flow of work from um, the kind of conceptualization of an idea through it to actually being in a customer's hand is usually somewhere in the region around 8%, which is pretty shocking really. So 92% of the time our work is just hanging around, not having anything done to it. And uh, you know, basically the work is idle. Everyone within this um, particular board is working like crazy, absolutely flat out. It's not like people are sitting there twiddling their thumbs or anything, they are working really, really hard. It's just that we've got so many weights, we've got so much stuff just lying around waiting to be um, uh, acted on uh, that actually 
um, we, we're not we're not really uh, getting the best that we can to get our uh, products and our ideas out to market as quickly as possible. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is I'm going to ask you to just take a moment to calculate the flow efficiency. So um, we're going to pop you again back into the same breakout rooms. Have a look at what you've got there. And the way that we do this is we will have a, have a look at the total amount of time that it took for that you calculated it took for um, the uh, um, resolution of the case that you've got there. So all of the cells. Then count up the, um, the green cells that you've got on there. And then you take the green cells, which is the active time, and you divide that by the total number of cells that you've got there, and that will give you the flow efficiency, okay? So I'd like you to just come up in your breakout teams, uh, your breakout rooms, with the flow efficiency for your version of the snake, um, and uh, just make a note of it, and we'll bring you back in three minutes. Shouldn't take you too long. I should be going across now. All right, welcome back. Okay, so um, we're going to ask you to do something for us, which is um, to go to the um, uh, go to the chat window. I'm going to ask you to put the uh, as a percentage the flow efficiency calculator, but not enter it. So type it in, but don't hit enter. Um, and once you've done that, could I get you all to? Uh, well, we'll give you we'll give you a few a few um, seconds for that uh, actually, and then I can give you give us all a thumbs up. But don't hit enter yet, please. Okay, hit <laughs> enter, please. Well, so we've got quite a range there. <laughs> this is the fifteen sixteen. Yeah, that's okay. But this, I mean, how, how each one of us have have um, yeah. been doing it. Okay. I, don't, I don't think um, we should do consultancy as a group. We can't agree on anything. <laughs> 16 is the answer, magic answer. <laughs> isn't, that, is it, isn't the fact that we don't agree exactly why we should be doing consultancy? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fact we can't count. <laughs> Dep okay. It depends. It depends. <laughs> so when we, when we did this uh, for our own example of ourselves, yeah, that this one that we had in here, um, we ended up with a 14, 14 green cells out of 86 in total, so that's about 16%. Um, if this was the real world and this was the real NHS or a real business, um, it would probably be, people could, could maybe um, rightly tell us that we have been um, extremely efficient given what we usually see, which is a lot lower. Um, and, and that's an interesting point because what this is kind of like, with no, those numbers, those the numbers that we see at, at one, five, one percent, five percent, eight percent, those are not great numbers. That means that the natural state of work is to be waiting. People are working really, really, really hard at the team level many times. But when you look at how all this is translating, the impact that all this work is making at the business level things are just not moving and, and typically it's because we are flooded by too much work flooded by too many initiatives yeah and even if we believe in business that what we are doing is adding value most businesses what they're actually doing at this level of flow efficiency what we're actually doing is just managing queues more than adding value the natural state of the work is to be dying in a queue feeling very very lonely we, we should be doing something better, yeah? Um, low flow efficiency environments are very, very difficult. And, and what we will say that it, in that case, if the, low, if the environment is, has a very low flow efficiency, it is actually much more important to visualize the waiting steps than the working steps. This is what we would call the wait flow. When we, when we do end to end, when we see in, in our, in our companies that we visit or our clients, when we start visualizing workflows, we, uh, we visualize the active steps and we rarely visualize the waiting elements of that workflow. Yet, if you measure the flow efficiency and you can, if you can actually make, measure the flow efficiency, the vast majority of those items, initiatives, projects, whatever they are, 
they are going to be in a waiting column, which we are not visualizing. So it is much more important to visualize the waiting steps and the working steps at this kind of low flow efficiency, which by the way, is the most common one to have very, very low flow efficiency. So hopefully that's an interesting, you know, concept um, and something that we, we it's, it's kind of like, we have to be careful with this as well because it, it sometimes the numbers are so low that they are scary. And, and we have done this with, cli with clients when we showed, when we tried to measure as much as we could and then show the first flow efficiency. And if we are not careful, it says something like five, eight percent. And then people go like, it's a cognitive dissonance. It's like, I, I don't want to know about this. So, but visualizing this is really, really important to start being able to be aware, to start to be able to have the right conversations. Okay. So um, going back to what we're saying, like uh, we need to move away from um, focusing just on this kind of like team level development aspect of, of agility. We need to have a much wider view of agile. Yeah. Um, and this is why, for example, Klaus um, Leopold can say like, you know, agile, uh, agile agility, business agility has nothing to do with the teams. It's much more important what's happening beyond the teams, between the teams, how the work gets to the teams or how it doesn't get to the teams. Yeah. Is this thing about like, yeah, we might be doing things, we might be delivering things every couple of weeks, but it took three years to get it, to get to the team first. Yeah. Um, so we might be having, if we focus just at team level, we might be getting agile at the team level, but the business is still probably um, quite lame and making an impact in the business, in the market. Yeah. Um, so try to avoid falling in this, what we call local optimization trap and keep having a systemic look of what's happening with agile. Um, systemic look of what's happening in your, in your organization, in your end-to-end -end process. So um, if we give you like some experiments that you might want to do, um, the first thing is what we just did. Um, try to visualize your end-to-end -end weight flow. So um, map your weight flow, map your end-to-end, -end, but focus on the, on the waiting stages. Um, map how the work arrives and departs your board. So you have to start expanding the view of what, what you are doing. Um, once you start identifying the waiting steps, Try to remove as many of them as possible. Many of them do not need to be there. Um, so you can try to start removing those, those uh, as many of them as you can. Um, capture the flow metrics um, across the end-to-end. -end. Start looking at like cycle times across the end-to-end. -end. Um, work in progress at initiative level. Go beyond the thing. Go at the portfolio, program, project, what we call flight level two, even flight level three. Um, one of the one of the most amazing metrics that we you can ever use is the aging metrics or the aging charts. Um, that if you can do that at the end uh, at your end to end flow, it allows us to start making decisions based on anticipating flow issues to avoid things getting stuck forever, things aging to the point that they're not useful anymore to anybody. So, use, using aging metrics is an amazing um, game changer in my opinion. And if you, if you look at all these things, then start looking about how the whole organization, how your business agility is all um, orchestrated together. Um, look at things like flight levels architecture. Um, so these are the possible experiments that we, we will suggest that you could do. Excellent. So to finish, JP. Just before we do that, uh, Nils, if you have a question, Put your hand yeah, raised. The, the, the aging metrics, is it this mm -hmm. one, um, the, the, the days the work spends on a specific process step, or how does the aging metric look like? Um, so what aging metrics will do, uh, how can I do this in 30 seconds? Aging metrics is the first leading metric. It was one of the very few leading metrics that um, we have at the moment. Um, and the, um, the key aspect that it does is that it, you have, uh, any, any work item that you're, you're at the moment tracking in your board, what you can know is how long, how old is it? What's the age? And then you can compare it to how, it's, how fast or slowly it's moving compared to 
work items that were done before. So it's a comparative measure. It's a comparative measure of pace and progress. And you can see it's like, okay, this, this, tic this ticket or this project is, or this item, whatever it is, mm -hmm. is 27 days old, but it's comparatively is moving faster than all the other work that we did before. So it's a, it's, it's a comparative metric and it's extremely powerful to anticipate um, flow metrics. Okay, right. So um, we're just going to pop you back into uh, very briefly into uh, breakout rooms. So um, just have a quick conversation about given this and some of the um, ideas that we had uh, of, of some experiments you could try. Uh, how might you use this um, uh, kind of with clients or back at work? Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll just pop you off there for a little while uh, bring you back in a couple of minutes uh, we'll wrap up and then have a brief q a uh, we'll also be sharing the session materials and so on for uh, those of you who've been asking we'll have a qr code in a second where we can share that so um just pop you off ahmad are you good to yeah I'm sending you across now Right, so um, if I could invite you again, um, as before with the uh, the chat, we're not going to do a, a chat storm this time, but just uh, pop your, uh, a, maybe one kind of thing that you think you're going to give a go, uh, one experiment you might try uh, that you've just been discussing into the chat and uh, just pop it in there so uh, we can share it with everyone. Uh, everyone can see. It's got aging metrics there. Visualizing blockages. Baseline to use. So end-to-end -end flow efficiency measurements. That's an interesting one. One thing um, we didn't say, but uh, it's important perhaps, is like flow efficiency is a metric that really comes to be at an organizational level, at the end-to-end. -end. Um, at a team level, it's a dangerous one, especially if you're using things already like agile frameworks, like, you know, Scrum or whatever else, yeah? Um, so uh, uh, the, the um, flow efficiency is really, really useful at the end to end. That's where you really see the, the numbers that become scary and useful, both scary and useful. Okay. Good stuff, so I've got to, some stuff to do with finding cues and trying out the late flow game. If you've got the bits and pieces, cool. Okay, um, Jose, do you want to share the uh, next slide, please? So if you want to um, find the uh, materials that we've got on this, we've got a, uh, a little QR code or there's a bit.ly link down there. So if you want to just capture that right now, um, you could be able to find the materials for this talk. We will put it on the Meta group as well, in yeah. the Linaja London Meta group. And also for those of you that came through the uh, virtual flight Meta group, we will also do it in the virtual flight club Meta group. So those two Meta groups, we will put the link there. And uh, we also, uh, on, on the slides, there's a few references. I'll just quickly pop onto those for a second because I've had a couple of people asking about further information. So um, obviously the flight level stuff, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it comes from, um, uh, well, Klaus Leopold has been talking about it for some time, but he discussed it at length in Rethinking Agile. We've got a few blog posts about um, flow efficiency and, and uh, getting work flowing through the systems. And there's a couple of videos uh, which um, uh, somebody's actually had uh, mentioned earlier on, which is the uh, uh, like so um, Niels uh, Niels Modig uh, his um, efficiency map paradox video, which is a TED talk, uh, which was the inspiration for our little exercise. And there's also his book up here as well. So um, apart from that, I think we're good to go to any questions and answers people have got. Uh, if you're if you want to hang around and ask some questions and, and um, have a little conversation, we're happy to hang around a little while longer. Otherwise, thanks very much for your active participation in the session, for joining us this evening. Um, it's been uh, really good to uh, get some, see some of your uh, interactions and your ideas. So, thank you very much as well for my. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Bob. I think I saw a question as we were along. Don't do that. I get embarrassed. Um, <laughs> uh, I do it. I don't. <laughs> I, I, saw, I saw a question from Khalil, but I just lost it. There are too many messages. Khalil, do you, do you want to? Oh, there you are. I'm just looking at it. 
They say, well, what would you consider to be different thresholds for fl of flow efficiency? Uh, what reading experiments can an organization consider? Um, what do you mean thresholds? Do you do you do you wanna if you're still on, do you wanna get your mic on and Hi Jose, Haru here. Good to see you. Hey, mate. Thank you both, right, for, both JP and Jose for amazing session again, man. Um yeah, I had a question about I think we discussed this a few months ago as well, but I had a question about what is um from a flow efficiency end to end perspective from inception to delivery to market. What would you consider to be a healthy flow efficiency? I've heard the term 20% or 15% flow efficiency seems to be the going rate, which is a healthy rate. But I wanted to get your perspective on your experiences. Um, uh, if you know, yeah. are, are there any thresholds that you've seen? Are there any patterns that you see which might be a good thing? You know, is 15% for example good or 20% good? So I, I, this is something that makes me slightly great question. Thank you. And, but it's also something that makes me slightly uncomfortable. I was having a conversation recently, well, recently, about a year ago with, with Daniel Vacanti. And the, the, the thing about flow efficiency to me is that we, we treat it. He doesn't like flow efficiency in some ways. And, and what, why we were talking about this was because the fact that you end up with a percentage, it looks like a metric. And once you start putting a number, oh, we are 8%, then you can start going into, well, we should become like double that, 16%. Flow efficiency really isn't, um, it's more of an indicator than a metric. What it's telling us, if you do the calculations and you give us the number, it's just telling us what is, how, how, how well are we flowing? Yeah? So, Generally in the market, you will hear that, you know, typically we'll see flow efficiencies of like one to five at, at business end to end. Um, it, some, some people will say, you know, in the, in the literature, it's like, no, you, you, if you're getting into the tens, 10 to 20, you are with a level of variability and complexity and uncertainty that the work that we have has, even at 10%, 15%, 20%, you're already doing awesome. And, and you started at one to five, you double your flow efficiency. I mean, imagine how incredibly successful many businesses are, yet our flow efficiency is really, 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 really poor when you look at the numbers, yeah? So if you could double the flow efficiency, how amazing our entire economy will be, our entire industry and productivity will be, without us having to do anything else, no more effort from, from, the, from the workers, just by making our processes more, less wasteful. And, and, the, and the mystery of this is reducing the amount of work in progress that we have, not just at the team level, but across the organization. Um, I, I was working with a company, for example, that they were, oh, you know, we, 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 need, to, we need to move the dial more in the market. They had about 10 teams, 10, 10 scrum teams, but they had 100 plus initiatives on the go. There was no way of focusing, no way of delivering anything effectively. Everything took ages to, to be done. And agility at the team level was, was, was never going to make a difference while the company was having a hundred or more than a hundred initiatives going on. Yeah. So I, I, I find it difficult to say 10%, 20%, 30%. I mean, some people say you're 40%, you will be one of the best companies in the world. Hmm. Maybe. I mean, it's a number. So um, your local the, average important, the, the important thing is about making it better. You, you have to keep doing it as better we can and, and, and have, this, uh, have this kind of like laser focus on like identifying where are, the, where are the unnecessary waiting steps and waiting times and trying to demolish those. That's my personal take. Um, sorry, Niels, I think you were, was you saying something? Ah, sorry, yeah, my, my, I was thinking I was stuck. I <laughs> heard a slight delay. Uh, so your local <laughs> average based on observations in UK <laughs> is um, like this maybe 10% and that's it. That's maybe the there were, uh, average. There were a couple of... And even if you improve 2%, <laughs> that's like 20%. So if you calculate in days, yeah. 100, 100 days for a project instead of 120, that's something mm -hmm. in time to that's market something. or customer mm -hmm. value created, whatever, whatnot. Yeah. Good. good point, maybe, very good maybe point. Maybe we should is that okay, is that okay Harun? Um, there were reports yeah, by people like a uh, guy, uh, Hungarian guy called Salt Fabok, and then by Hakan Forsch from Sweden, and they were uh, they reported a few years back um, ah. some some um, 
metrics that they have captured from the market and, and literature from out there. And one of the things that came up was this, uh, that at, at end to end, really end to end, when, when you capture as much as you can about the waiting times and, and you have re reliable, what, um, reliable mapping of the workflow, um, the typical numbers were one to five. Oh, and wow. probably er erring towards the one, not the five. So um, essentially, we have a plague of inefficiency in our businesses. And I say, these are businesses that can be making billions. So imagine, imagine if we, we, we improve our efficiency even a little bit, how much better our, our entire economy could be. So, okay. I mean, anybody, any, anybody has a different, um, um, your own experiences, please share it. I mean, um, this is just, I, I've been the only one talking. <laughs> Imagine what the flow efficiency used to be like when we started with the analyst programmers who were testing their own code. You could go and talk mm -hmm. to them in the morning and get the code in by the evening. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we need to get back to, analyst programmers. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> good. Sorry, but, JP. But, it, but even then, Scott, there are still people who are deciding what they should build and people who are researching what should be done. And then there are approval steps before that. So this is kind of this is kind of the problem is that we always focus on the analyst programmer rather than everything that's happening to get the analyst programmer doing the work in the first place. Honestly, back when I started, a box of donuts got you ahead of the queue. <laughs> Oh, nuts and coffee <laughs> equal code. Uh. <laughs> with Jose, with Jose, it's uh, uh, those uh, year Palmyra things. Okay. Yeah. Um, a quick one. I saw John Lind with hands up. So John, would you thanks for having me. And uh, just to echo the, the the first guy, really interesting uh, visualization. And I've, having seen the efficiency paradox, and then see that as a visual, it's uh, it makes it even more real for different kinds of people so a, a, a brilliant artifact and vehicle to be able to show people thank you for the inspiration yeah um, uh, for me and actually going into that is even less than a number is like if you visualize that and it looks very very red try to make it a little bit more green yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely um yeah and um, i had a question I, I i've sort of uh, the semantics of uh, introduce uh, flight levels architecture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got an idea of the semantics and how that breaks down a little bit. Could I ask, before I put my bias in in the question, could I ask for a little bit of yours, please? About, uh, about what was the what was the question? Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, the the flight levels architecture. What does that mean? Introduce flight levels architecture. JP, were you saying? Or maybe? so I mean, you know, some of the the, the whole. So there's a couple of things. One, flight levels itself is a thinking model, which is what we very, very briefly touched on at the beginning. I'm, I'm not going to go wildly into the depth of that because it, it takes quite a while to pull it up, put it all apart. We haven't got the time right now. But the key thing here is really, um, you know, having, uh, well, visualizing what's going on in the organization um, at the various different levels. Typically, we focus only on the, the, the team level when, when people start being agile, which is flight level one. But, you know, bring in flight level, uh, bring in a, a visualization of, of flight level two, so the end to end stuff. But then also, uh, you know, what's happening at the strategy level and how does that map to what's happening at the end to end level? And then, you know, what are the interactions that are required to make that stuff happen? So instead of it sitting in some uh, executives to do list for a year for them to approve it, well, what can we do to kind of speed that along and understand, you know, how we get work flowing nicely through our system uh, so that's really what kind of in a very very brief nutshell i've probably undersold it somewhat but what we're referring to there is just kind of start applying this thinking at the organizational level um, to understand what's going on and where you can improve thank you um, can i can, if i can add one thing quickly john as well to, the, to what jp was saying as well is like if you if you view your organization as a network or in uh, a network or, or, or ecosystem of what we would call normal Kanban, Kanban systems or cells or teams or whatever. Um, with what we do with the architecture with flight levels and, the, and flight levels architecture is to start understanding how all these things connect to each other. So the connections and how, how does information and communication, as JP was saying, flow from strategy to the orchestration, coordination, dependency, down to delivery operations and so on. So it's, it's about how do we make our organization something that is 
both coherent, focused, and consistent in delivering value all the way from, from a strategy down to the, to the nitty gritty operational delivery aspects of the organization. So it's making that ecosystem be something that using flow principles come together. Brilliant, thank you. Cool. What yeah. about your, what about your, your thoughts? Uh, I would put in, um, uh, as less has the, the idea of the improvement service uh, mm -hmm. from strategy down to execution and back. Mm -hmm. So yes, as well. That strategy has a feedback, but um, and that's where the, mm -hmm. your flights class. Mm -hmm. uh, you did ahead of flights class, but I, I, I wasn't able to deconstruct the language of maybe I didn't look into it enough of the mm -hmm. flights class. I didn't understand was about that, and if I'd known that, I think I would have come and do that. Are you going to do that again at some point? We are. So we'll do, we'll, we'll we'll send the sales pitch later. <laughs> no, <laughs> Thank you. It's okay. I'm, I'm, I haven't been planted as well. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, so no, yeah, but, but basically, yes, is uh, we and okay, like like anything that is agile as well, it has the feedback loops for improvement because obviously organizations are not a static beings. We, we they they change, they mutate, we learn, we improve. Absolutely right. So that there's a, there's a couple of there's a couple of points that people have put into the chat. So someone's actually put a blog post about um, that Klaus has written about flight levels architecture, um, mm -hmm. and um, Anna has highlighted that. Klaus is actually doing a, a talk with uh, Agile Lean Ireland on their meetup tomorrow. So uh, mm. they, they're good friends of ours. So go and check that out. If you want to get some more information, uh, it should be good. Yes. Thanks everyone. Absolutely. Um, I saw a question before about, was it uh, Tara? I don't know if Tara is still oh, here. Yes. But it says, yeah. Hi, uh, yes. hi Tara. It was something about whether all weight was bad. Yeah, sorry, it's a very naive question. And apologies, I was late in, but I uh, found it really interesting. Um, I've kind of done a lot of process work around sort of activity-based stuff as well. And I, I, I kind of understand the kind of concept of efficiency. But if, 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 I, if I sat in the senior management and I saw a figure of 10%, I'd be going, get it up to 90%. Yes. Um, and, and there's an element of how you set expectations with this. And, and mm -hmm. what really is realistic? That that was my only sort of question around mm -hmm. that. And anybody has any thoughts on that? I have an answer. <laughs> I have my view of it. Anna, Niels, or oh, Anna? Anna. Okay, start with Anna. This this question was already. Wait, wait, wait Niels. Let's, let's start with Anna quickly. I think. Well, the thing is, if you are filled in hundred percent of time and something else comes in, where do you put that time in then? If something mm -hmm. st has started the flow, it should finish as soon as possible. But if I'm fully filled and if our flow is over the capacity or 90%, if something else comes in, where do you put it? That's one of the questions. Another question would be cars on the highway. If every, if every uh, car is on the highway, how they, do they move? So. That's usual examples that you can give to your management. Why don't you overload your people with a hundred percent, 90%. They need mm -hmm. uh, also uh, to have some free space in the between, but that doesn't mean that they should be sitting waiting for the stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a balance between. And I think the best answer would be do not go as uh, Jose has said, don't go with a number. Look where your red points are and try to shorten them. Niels? Uh, exactly what Anna said. There are good <laughs> waiting cues. I think many, many waiting cues are good to like mm -hmm. give it some thoughts. Don't rush everything yeah. through the pipeline. There, there are bad ideas that shouldn't be done. <laughs> My, one of the things that I usually will say, because that's the typical thing. I mean, you say, oh, we're, we're, we're at the 10%, okay, whatever, 5%. And then someone immediately says, oh, well, that's a terrible number. I want it to be 90%. First of all, it's like, okay, we are five. Can you get it to six or seven or eight? Yeah, they start with that. But the other one is like, the nature of our work is just to, I mean, uh, hopefully all of us are familiar with the term VUCA. The nature of our work is volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Yeah, there is too much variability in the kind of, in, in the kind of like complex knowledge work that we do. Um, so it is literally impossible, um, so, unless someone can correct me, and um, 
to get to those numbers. As, as we were saying before, I mean, uh, a lot of people will say that even if we are at 10 or 20%, that could be already awesome. If you uh, there is common number that people say, like if you are at 40%, you probably are one of the best knowledge world, uh, knowledge work companies in the world today. Uh, I don't know who would be a 40%, but anyway, numbers, forget about the numbers, yeah? Um, so the the problem with, with, an, with putting numbers for me is that then we start we start gaming this we start going to numbers that we just become ridiculous or the other way around is that instead of looking at the end to end the end to end looks horrible ah look at the team even something like a scrum that's already a way of of you know, scrum is 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 a really really great framework to to optimize and you know, or make it more efficient work at the team level so if you if you were doing flow efficiency at the team level with a scrum, you will hit bigger numbers. Um, company where we did this a few years ago, um, they were like measuring 40, 60 percent flow efficiency at the team level, and they were like, "Oh, we have we have no problem. Flow efficiency is not an issue for us." And you were like, "Whoa, whoa wait! You are looking at the team. What about the end to end?" The end to end was eight percent, and they were like horrified, and they were like, "Oh, we ignore that." Yeah, so. Um, that's the danger with the numbers. I mean, for a start, it's like, you know, just the kind of work that we have, it's just not possible to get to 90%. Um, unless, if someone has a different opinion, please share it. I'd love to hear that as well. So we've had, we've had a number of questions actually from Ben, yeah. Ben Parry. Just, qu uh, Tara, just quickly, Parry? Tara, did that ask, did, are you okay with that? Um, yeah, yeah, no, thank you for that. And I've, I've kind of okay. seen some of the comments as well. But yeah. and, and, the other, and, the, and the other thing I would say, like, are useful as buffers, as way of, like, um, smoothing the flow because the, because it's variable and so on. So the, the, when you have deliberate, intentionally designed waiting steps to smooth your flow, bring it on, yeah? When they're just uncontrolled, undesigned, unplanned, um, that's a nightmare, and and I, I recommend reading uh, the book by Clark Ching. The the what's it called? The the bottleneck rules. Bottleneck it's rules. An awesome yeah. book. It's an awesome book on bottlenecks and flow on on these kind of things. Actually, Clark Clark did do a um, uh, did our meetup. Uh, he was actually I'm one of our, our, our first remote uh, remote meetup. So if you have a look on our um, mm -hmm. on, is it, well, we've got we've got it posted somewhere. Is it on the website? I'll say. It's, it's in Lina del London, but yes, we, we will share the link again on that okay. uh, if I remember. Okay, so ben, ben Ben Parry's been very patiently asking questions. We've not responded one of them. He's got a bunch of them. So, which, which one would you like us to address, Ben? Um, maybe about work on the the visual the stream mapping. Mm -hmm. At the moment, so, I've got ready for states in every phase of activity in end to end. So, I've always been very curious about where time is going. Mm -hmm. And I guess we've got to a point now where we've got to work out what action can you take. So if you know that 30% of your time end-to-end -end is spent in analysis, for example, what do you do next? Do you sort of then try to be a bit more detailed in your investigation? What's, it, what's a critical path in a particular activity? Do you, do you ever do that forensic kind of sequential check? That's a very difficult question to answer without knowing the the actual context so I, I'm, I'm afraid that it could be a one of, of it depends i don't know yeah. I, I really don't know without knowing yeah. the flow um the the, the thing the thing that is important for me um and i might be wrong um ian i uh, saw so you have put your hands up so ian will, will say something here next but I'll just quick one one thing for me which is really important many times these things that we are doing with the visualizations with these things is, is not about just necessarily coming up with this answers is like it's, it's actually it's helping us to ask the right questions as earlier before and where to ask those questions so it might be that you're saying okay we have we're spending a lot of time on analysis then that might give you the opportunity to say okay is that the right thing is should that be happening is that helping us to to manage the flow um I, I have this thing what we call our rules of flow. And, and for example, one thing that I see many times is that we spend way more time planning stuff and analyzing the stuff than doing it. And the actual discovery of what, it's gonna, what to do and how to do it and what the customer needs mm. is in doing it and getting the feedback loop from the end customer. So mm. if, for example, if your workflow seems to be unbalanced toward analysis and planning and approval, 
hopefully you can visualize that or you can you can analyze that to say like is this the right thing that should be doing how could we get the answers faster or ask the right questions earlier and faster and so on that that, that would be my take um ian would you like to add something no, no. I mean, I, 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 ian was saying goodbye so that's why oh. he's waving. so ben um <laughs> okay. to, to, to your to your point i mean mm. So Martin Fowler's got this absolutely great phrase. I think actually it was Kent Beck's originally, but I, I, I first read it in one of Martin Fowler's books, which was um, this idea of code smells, which is like you, 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 when the code is a bit smelly, you need to do something about it. So I would say that if I was observing something, you know, if, you, if I'd kind of done a, a map like that and I'd, I'd found that there were areas which... Smells which smell because there's there's stuff hanging around. It's, it's a prompt to go and investigate and find out what's going on, but I wouldn't necessarily have a prescriptive. It must be this. No. Um, mm-hmm. And but certainly, yeah. and, and certainly as, as far as like kind of having ready for states, mm. um, depending on exactly how you're managing those ready for states, whether you've got things like work in progress limits or policies yeah. for dealing with those, yeah. um, you know, there's always a way of, I mean, ideally getting it to a point where maybe, reduce the number of ready for states that you've got so that you have like true pull going on but that might not be possible in your context there's a whole load of things like that but i like to think of of these things as like you know it's you know it's all a detective story and you're off on a hunt to try and find clues and that's just a clue i just thought should an organization be looking at where cues are building up where waiting is happening and and that could result in how do you T-shape? How do you, how do you get people to, to decide on what skills they should upskill on? Things like that, yeah, absolutely. Why not? Sounds, sounds sensible, yeah. But, I don't but know, it, is that common? Is that what people usually do? Well, 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 often, well often, but the one, thing, uh, the one thing I would say about, and Jose will, will say something in a minute, but with, with one thing I would say is eliminating cues, um, you know, especially ones which are just kind of there because, uh, is actually a lot cheaper than spending an awful lot of money on retraining people or, um, you know, getting people to be like fabulously T-shaped or whatever. Um, you know, if you can reduce queuing, you instantly get bang for your buck without having to spend a whole load of money in getting uh, people to reskill or getting people outside of their comfort zone. So reducing the amount of work that you're trying to do at once and uh, reducing the size of your queues is actually you know, it's, it's just kind of dealing with process rather than having to deal with people. I know Jose's a, got bit, a, thing. a bit of an example. I often see developers who might be working on seven things at a time. So mm-hmm. nobody can work on seven things at a time. They're working on one thing and six things are queued. So that's why mm-hmm. I think it's just about being honest. So it might be ready for doing that activity, but are you actually touching it and doing it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. I, and, 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 and to that end is, you know, why do they feel the need to have to work on seven things at once? what what can be done to make it okay <laughs> oh well there you go <laughs> what, what what's happening what's happening i mean looking at with the flight level thinking there what's happening in your organizational structure that is allowing all these seven things to hit the team or the or the, the individual could you could you have better ways of focusing because i mean i i i've seen teams that they have like and they do again scrum team they do sprint planning they have selected 10 pbis but each PBI is from a different product, mm-hmm. and you're thinking like, where is the va- where is the focus there? You know, each one of those PBIs probably is going to add very very limited value, rather than you know, wh- why are we so out of focus? Organis- this is a smell. I'm going to register flowsmells.com, but anyway. Mm. Um, so, but this is this is an this is company. smell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is a this is probably a, a a smell that organizationally we are not managing the flow. We are not managing, we are not focused organizationally. Yeah. Um, is what I saw with this company, like, you know, 100 plus initiatives for 10 teams. The teams were spinning plates constantly, just trying to pretend almost that because everybody had to report progress on any one, all these 100 initiatives. So everything was doing very tiny amount of, of progress, nothing that moved the dial, nothing that created real impact, but lots and lots of effort. Uh, um, going to what JP was saying, I used to let Danny Van Kante used to have a company and the motto was um, change everything by changing nothing. Mm. Uh, and, and it was all about just zero in at, at this level of flow efficiency, zero in on the waiting, on the waste, because we don't have to change anything of what we do. Mm. Just, just, just eliminate unnecessary cues. 
the low hanging um, fruit. Niels, I see you with the hands up. Yeah. yeah, but based on what I saw today is yeah. the VIP limit on an individual developer on a team level doesn't matter at all, right? It's just it has value. Optimization. Yeah. It, it has it, value, it, it of has, course, yeah, totally yes. on the, on the yeah. local flow level, but yes. uh, I think that the development part, like the team level, sprint, whatever iteration, is yes. 10% of end-to-end -end delivery, right? Yeah. Discovery, delivery, end-to-end, -end, upstream, yeah. downstream yeah. combined, yeah. Mm. Less, maybe? If, you, if, you, if we want to make a real difference organizationally, we have to look beyond the team. This is what this is this thing about, like, you know, business agility has nothing to do with teams. It has to do what happens beyond the team. Yeah? If we, if we understand. And, and, that, and, that's, and that's the core of what we, we try to then visualize through flight level architectures and what we call flight routes and all those things, all those maps. If, if we if we try to under, if we're able to understand what our organization's uh, capability and uh, to deliver is and capacity to do work, then we're really cooking with gas. But most organizations are a mile away from doing that. So because it's easier to do that at the team level, that's where they focus. And I guess that's kind of the punchline. Second is <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah. Team level agility is important, but. At a business level, to really make a, a difference to the organization, we need to look beyond the team. Okay. Famous last um, words. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's past seven thirty, so that's kind of like the time box. Shall we take one final question? Is there any one final question, or shall we call it the day? Who is dying to to get the last comment? You are clearly <laughs> Sylvia. I saw, I saw Sylvia going like this. Um, sorry, yeah, I was looking for the hands thing and couldn't find it. Um, <laughs> this is a question based on the last client I worked with because it took me um, six weeks, two months to get them to actually put a, a, a waiting column on the board because um, you know mm -hmm. visualizing their work was completely new to them, etc. Um, so there was a real pushback by the team themselves, let alone anyone else in the end-to-end -end process. Mm -hmm to even talk about wait time. So it took a lot of work to get them to to think this was important and to even give it yes. a try. So do you have any tips for kind of um, dealing with that pushback or, or getting them to even consider it as an experiment? So it's not, not quite such a pain to get it going in the first place. Um, so I've got, I got a number of, of thoughts about this. Um, the, the first thing is like, I, I have so many. I have so many friends that are, I'm, I'm slightly blanking out. Um, shall I, shall I, <laughs> go for it, JP. Well, okay. I'm, I'm so, so, so one thing that I heard there, and, and maybe you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Sylvia, but it kind of sounds to me like maybe they weren't even ready to see what was there. No, no they weren't. Which is why I kind of stepped back and why it took two yeah. months. I could see that. Yeah. But there's some, there's a whole bunch of other stuff I had to do first to even get to them at the point of being ready to look at uh, a queue. Which, so, so, which we so, did. So we, I, I, you know, I have shared experience of that. Sometimes people aren't ready for, you know, things like that. And you have to drag them softly along. If you go too quickly, then you can end up losing them for when you have more, yeah. you know, more to do later on. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I probably would have done much the same thing, frankly. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Jose, have you got yeah. a different idea? Yeah, so no, no, no it, it was actually about that. It's just like, I don't know how, I still don't know how to articulate this. Um, so we, we, many times we, you, you're, you're, this, you're so, many times people, we, we, have, we all have blind spots and we don't know mm. what we don't know, yeah? So maybe um, the, the importance of, a, of, a, of visualizing those, those waiting steps are, it's just not even understood. Yeah. I've yeah. been in a place where I didn't understand the value of them. You know, so yeah. I haven't been thinking like what we said today, not even three, four, five years ago. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know what I said numbers, whatever numbers I said. Um so um so this is about a question like how can how can you create the safety to 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 bring that knowledge or awareness or even experimentation to see like, hey, let's do an experiment, see what will happen if we start visualizing this. Or mm -hmm. questions about like, is this really how we do the work? Oh, so we move from we move from development to test straight away. Yeah. Oh no. Okay, so maybe there is something in between. What is that? Call it whatever you want. Yeah. And yeah. Then, okay, is that is that an act? So you 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 might be doing through little by little persuasion. But what Repi was JP was saying there about the, the readiness. I I 
these days we you know we, we are talking a lot about maturity models and i think that's a that concept is we are recording but i will edit this this the maturity models are bollocks sorry um <laughs> it's it, it's all about it's all about readiness and willingness yeah we 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 have been in situations that we have tried to do something because it makes sense too soon for the people that need to benefit or suffer the consequences they were not ready um and they might not be willing either yeah and when when we get the right mix of readiness and willingness then magic can happen you can have this this really yeah. amazing step forward but trying to push something too soon or too late. That's been my, that's been my experience of it. So, I mean, yeah. what, I, what I did with these particular people was actually, um, mm. they like, they, they got numbers. So we introduced them to cycle time. We'll just, you know, how long overall does it take to get a piece of, and they were shocked by the number. So yeah. then that led into, okay, well, why is it that number? Why does it take four weeks when you thought it took a week yeah. in general to get these things do? And eventually we got to, a lot of that time was waiting for meetings to be arranged. So, yeah. so, so, one, and, and that's the great thing. Sorry, Jimmy. One, one additional thing, actually, thought that sparked is, um, you know, if you find yourself in this situation again, not only cycle time, you could also show them how their work is aging as well. Aging. Yeah. And but, and you know, what, uh, there, somebody came out with a phrase which is like, you know, like uh, work in progress is like is like fish. The longer it hangs around, the more it smells. And, oh, that's you know, a good it's, one. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's yeah. you know with with uh, you know showing the age of it. If they have got something where they they they, they say there isn't a cue here, <laughs> yeah. and you just see it going up and up yeah. and up that chart for age, then yeah. you know it, it, they can't deny that. So it, it's just yeah. it's showing what's happening inside that cycle time before yeah. it gets to the end. So um, you know, I found once they hit that, that, that point, they were quite keen. So when I left them, that's the point we'd got to. I'd introduced them to an aging chart. Um, yeah. We've been they're questioning each other, the whip, you know, amongst each other and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it was that initial, it took me two months to get them to. Uh, yeah, I mean, folks, the, the, the one company that you've been working in, in Ireland, it, it, you know, we were there for working with them for six months to kickstart the, their journey in some ways to help them start. Um, we very early on were talking to them about the end to ends and the flow efficiencies and all these things. Um, it took them two years to even accept that visualizing end to end was important and visualizing wow. waiting yeah. steps. Um, but that was that was how, how long it took them to be ready for it, to be aware, mm -hmm. to really interiorize that. Oh, there is something here that we could do better. When they finally decided that, yeah, that was that was it. That was what they need to do. Then they moved super fast. Yeah. Yeah. But but you know we we were long gone. <laughs> yeah. You know we uh, it took Human two years for thing, that it? to be to, yeah and, and that's it and, and we but if we had pushed it, it would have been even worse because they would have rejected it for potentially forever. So we kind of like said, this is an important concept. If you're not interested on it, that's fine. But keep it in mind because at yeah. one point it probably will make sense. Yeah. Uh, and it took two years and that was absolutely fine. The company was awesome to work with and and really really good in agility. Yeah. And it took two years. <laughs> That makes me feel a whole lot better. <laughs> that it's not just so. Me. Yeah. So, so some of these things just just take mm. time, and, and it is it is what it is. Well, thank you. Cool. All right. All right. Shall we leave it with that? It's getting late. Um, I would just say thank you very much for 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 this. I mean, I, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed the Q and A as well. So thanks a lot for all for all this, and we like to do. Um, Lena, no, 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 we want to meet. see you on your cross trainer. <laughs> that's, that's later on. <laughs> <laughs> that's the page. Oh, um, it gets used, by the way. It's a vanga. It's a background. It's not there. <laughs> so, um, so it's like, yeah, we will we'll share the we we will edit the video, but we'll share the video and the slides on the Lena Jar London Meetup Group, um, also in the Virtual Flight Club Group. If you're there. Um, follow up with any questions. You, um, we will send you um, links if you want to continue this conversation in in the meta groups, in Slack, or whatever. It would be great to, to have this conversation. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for a great evening. I really enjoyed it. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.